Thank you very much, Frederick. The stage is yours and enjoy. We are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you and thanks for the introduction. I'm happy to be here. Now I wanted to I wanted to talk about customer experience today and how to how to make sure that first of all that, that you create a, a positive business case that you actually deliver on, but also how do you get your initiatives through uh, when when you've started doing uh, your customer experience uh, projects? You you already gave me a very nice introduction, so thank you very much. I just wanted to add one thing uh, because this is actually quite relevant for for what we're going to talk about. Daman has a, a strategy of putting digital at the heart of the UAE healthcare ecosystem. So our strategy is is to connect us with everybody in the in the healthcare ecosystem and also help the players in the ecosystem connect to connect to each other through us and that's not possible if you don't have a very very strong and very focused customer and user experience and i'm using customer and user experience because when when you're thinking about it then you need to think about both aspects you need to think about the concept of customer experience which is the the outward facing uh, activities that you're doing for your partners and for your customers and, and for your for your policyholders, for example, in the case of insurance, but also user experience. And user experience is the experience that that your employees are actually having when they're using and accessing the systems. And why is that important? That is important because at the end of the day, a good customer experience is only as good as the processes running behind the customer experience in the company. So if, if you are having broken processes or systems that are impossible to use for, for your employees, that will directly reflect to the customer experience that you're offering to your, to your customers. So when you're thinking about this, think about user experience as both your customers and what they see and experience, but also the ability or the capability that you provide your employees to use your system so they can actually provide the customer experience. So that, that is very important. And it's also, it's also important to, to take a look at what it, what it actually is that we are covering when we are talking about customer experience. Because it's, as I said, it's much more than, than just what the customer experience is. It's, it's a sum of so many moving parts. It is, of course, it is what the customer sees and experiences when interacting with you. It is about how many steps do we have to take to complete an action? Uh, and what is the experience? Is the tone of voice good or bad? Is it easy to find where to click or to, to push on, on the smartphone? What is the branding? Does does it make me feel welcome when I'm there with the, with the images used, the colors and everything? How, how can I access this experience? Can I, can I go from one channel to another without having to explain who I am one more time? And of course, and, and is it easy for me to use the systems? So, so that is that is one part. This is what the customer sees and experiences. And you have all the things that are happening behind the scenes. This is the data that you're using to, to work with the customer. If you have poor data quality, well, then your customer experience is going to be poor as well. What are the rules that you're working with and around the customers? If this happens, then what are they defined? Do you actually know if a customer sees this? What is the next step, the next action that you're going to do with this customer to make sure that they have a good experience with you? It is how you use your analytics, your artificial intelligence. And again, if, if your data are, are not good, then use of artificial intelligence will not be very successful, simply because the, your artificial intelligence will suggest weird things to your customers, which will give them a negative experience instead. And I already said uh, about the processes and, and your employees' ability to actually serve your customers. Now, another thing, because this is, uh, we're going to talk about how to set up the, the return on investment and, and actually measure it. So a very important thing in all this is, of course, your key performance indicators. And I've just taken some of, one of the most important here that, that we're going to use to talk about later. There is one which is time to resolve especially when you are in the insurance industry, then you want to make sure that your customers or your policyholders, they have as little hassle as possible. Because in general, nobody likes to deal with an insurance company because it takes time they have to call. And whenever you have to deal with an insurance company, in most cases, you've had an unfortunate experience, right? So you have to find a claim. So for for, for insurance company, the time to resolve how fast can you actually deliver what you're supposed to deliver 
What are your turnaround times? Uh, if, if you receive a claim, for example, as an insurer, how, what is the turnaround time for the customer to actually get a yes or no for that claim? What is the, the turnaround time for complaints? What is the time for picking up the phone? All these things have sales, the revenue, cross sales, up sales that you are, your company is able to do based on the customer experience satisfaction. Customer effort score is widely used outside the Middle East, but, but customer effort score is actually a measurement that shows how difficult is it for a customer to achieve what he or she wanted to do. So what effort do they have to put in to file a claim, for example? And this is a measurement that, that you can use to see how difficult you are to, to deal with as a company. And then, of course, cost to save. What does it cost to keep the operations running? So in terms of number of transactions that you have, what is the cost for you to have per transaction? And that's when you're talking about business cases and optimization, this is an extremely important measurement. But let's, um, let's take a look at, at return on investment and, and the concept of return on investment. One of the things that, that you should start out with, and this is a very, very simple model, but extremely important to remember when you start working on business cases, is this one. Project benefits can only be two things. Either it can help you sell more, increase your revenue, or it can help you make more money, meaning that you can reduce your costs. So when you're creating business cases, when you're looking at what is the value of this initiative, then you'll be looking at, do we make more money in terms of more sales, or do I have a higher profit in terms of reducing the costs that I'm doing? And of course, if you're making more sales, then, well, you'll make profit of those sales, so that also contributes positively to your project benefits. It's important this because a project costs money to complete and you need to show within a certain amount of time that this project actually pays itself off. And if you can't measure this, well, you can't go to, to your board of directors or whoever have to go to and say, I need these millions to do this project, uh, but I don't know how to get the money back. You need to show I get the money back because this and this. So I've just put some, some digitalization use cases here that have clear benefits for return on investment calculations. And we can go through them. You can see the, the chatbot or the virtual assistants. Well, if you set up a chatbot or virtual assistants, then in my experience, our data uh, is, is, is rarely good enough to have a very advanced chatbot up and running. It's getting there, but, but few companies actually have it. But what you can use a chatbot for a virtual assistant is what I call the first line of defense. That means that around 70 to 80% of the people who contact you have simple questions that they need answers. And this is where you can automate the way that they get these answers through the chatbots, which means that you will have fewer people to, to pick up the phone, which means that your cost to server will, will be reduced, which means that your profit will increase by doing this initiative. You can look at uh, predictive analysis for, for planning. If you're using artificial intelligence in your call center, for example, and over some time, this artificial intelligence will actually be able to tell you exactly how many people should be on what shift. And in that sense, you will be able to plan more um, optimal, making sure that, that your SLAs are kept at, uh, at peak times, but also that you're not having too many people working uh, when, when there is nobody calling. And you can, you can predict this. And that will give you, again, cost savings in the terms that your, 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 workflow, your, your workforce management is going to be so much more effective. Obviously, when you're working with process automation, well, then you're automating the processes. You're eliminating um, steps in your workflows that are unnecessary, which means that your average time to deliver will be reduced, which means that overall your cost will be reduced because your time spent is reduced. And... I know when I, when I start talking about this and, and I go into this area, we always talk about the concept of FTEs and, and people, they say, but we're going to fire people or what's going on. We are working with FTEs in the, in the term of full-time equivalence. So when we're talking FTEs, we're not necessarily talking about people who don't have to have a job tomorrow because we've optimized it. We're talking about the time saved and the time saved can be measured in the equivalent of a full-time employee. And that has a value. I'm not suggesting that these people, they need to leave the company. I'm suggesting that you prove that your project has saved this many FTEs equivalent, and that equivalent has this value to the company. Whether 
you choose to, to let the people go or you choose to redeploy them to do something else or upskill them so they can do new jobs in the company. Well, that's not part of this. This is part of showing what is the value of the project that you're doing. So, so these are some of the... Um, these are some of the, the, the business cases that you can look into when, when you are doing your, your customer experience, project optimization or digitalization. There, there's another thing when you're doing business cases is, is you should think about uh, is, is the time frame. What is the realistic time frame? Is it, I mean, when, when I was young, which is a long time ago, and we did a return investment, we looked at a five-year horizon. I don't think that's suitable for many investments anymore, especially how the, the world is fluctuating and going now. We are typically suggesting two to three years maximum. And if you can show positive results within the first year, that's just even better. So, so this is what is the time frame when you're trying to do your calculations? Two to three years, I would assume. Remember, if you are taking the increased sales as, as, um, as one of the benefits of your project, that is not profit. If I make 100 dirhams more today, I cannot put 100 dirhams as profit in the bank because I have my operating expenses. So when you are doing this business case, use some kind of standard uh, profit percentage to, to show how the increased revenue will pay off on what you're working on, right? So 100 dirhams doesn't mean that you have 100 dirhams to, to pay for your project investments. You typically have maybe, I don't know, 10%, 15% of, of your revenue that you can use to, to pay off your projects. And um, another thing is, one, one thing is the return on investment. How long time does it take to actually get all my money back that I invested in this. But another thing is, when is it that the money that I'm spending on this project is less than the, the benefits, the profits the project is giving me? This is called break-even. And it's another important point because this is a way for you to control your cash flow. Uh, and when you calculate when is the break-even, then the money you have to have out of pocket before break-even is, is the maximum of money that you have to ask your, your CFO for to do this project. Maybe it's going to be more expensive, but the cash flow is different. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense, but, but I'm hoping somebody stops me if, <laughs> if, if it doesn't. But the, the thing is that the second that you break even, that means that you are, you're making more money that you're spending. And the, ma the money that you're making, you start to pay off the money you spend in the beginning. So, so the amount of cash that you spend until your break-even point, that is the maximum amount of cash that you're ever going to be have to borrow from your CFO to get this project running. I also, I also encounter this um, realism gap because when you want to do a project, you're excited about it, you, you want to get it started. And, and, and since typically it's, it's your project that you're doing the project calculation for, you love it and, and you are overly optimistic. And that also reflects in the business case. Saying, yeah, but of course we're going to get this many customers. Or of course we can do it this fast. But in reality, um, we, we, we all tend to be over-optimistic when creating business cases. So it, it makes good sense to have um, your financial controllers or others to, to scrutinize and work with you to make it more realistic because maybe the business case looks good in the beginning and you get it approved. But if, if you don't believe uh, deliver on the numbers, it's... It, it doesn't work right. So, um, so, so make sure that you're not too optimistic. Uh, and, and also, when you're doing this, have A, B, and C plans. So if the revenue is not coming, if the profits are not coming as expected, can you stop the project? Should you stop the project? Are there other things that you can do to make sure that it goes break even and it actually pays the investment, back, pays the investment back? So think about if it's not going the way I want it to go, what are we doing? Uh, to what point is the point of no return? How, how far into the project can we actually stop and say it, it didn't work, so let's stop it? Or if it's not working, what else can we do? And, and the last, I mean, you, you can't do a, a return on investment if, if you don't have tangible benefits. So, um, so you have to, 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 to drill down and say, okay, what does this actually mean in terms of increased uh, revenue sales or reduced uh, costs uh, and make it very, very tangible? It is very rarely that, that I see projects that are not possible to make tangible. Uh, so so these, these are some of the ideas that you think of when, uh, when you are calculating the return on investment. And when you do this, and, and this is from a, from a project management point of view, you actually have another benefit because then you have a series most likely of projects that are planned or prepared to be planned or ongoing in the organization. And, and as far as I know, uh, all organizations, they have 
more projects than they have people to deliver. So you need some way of of uh, prioritizing the projects. And when you do these return on benefits, like that we're talking about here, then it's possible for you to to prioritize your projects based on the development times and costs it takes to complete the project, but also the benefits of the project. This one is is a very very simple tool, but but we use it. Um, to, to, to help us prioritize the projects we're working on, simply. And you can see that there is, to, to, the, to the fast right, there is this called must-do, and these are the, the regulatory and compliance, uh, compliance um, projects. You cannot really calculate a return on investment on this one, apart from if you don't do it, you can't stay in business because you, you won't get your license renewed, right? So those are the projects that just have to be done. Otherwise, uh, the, the projects that have the, the highest benefit and uh, the shortest development time or cost, obviously, is pri highest priority and should be put there. Projects with little uh, benefits and long development time, well, you should consider cancelling them. Put them in a backlog and, and never talk to them again, so to speak. <laughs> and so, so this, for me, is, is a very important tool to, to help prioritize and get the projects done. But uh, when you're starting working on the projects, you will probably also feel that things are not going as fast as you wanted, especially when it's, it's digital initiatives. And I like to I like to address why that is because there are there are some some reasons or some areas that that makes it take longer than necessary to get projects done, especially in large organizations. And and there are there are four main areas that I like to address, and it's the area of of technical debt, the us versus them in the organization. It is the resources and its organizational capabilities. And allow me just to, to, to take a, a trip around each one of them because if or when you understand this, you will also understand what levers to, to work with in your organization to get your projects to happen a little faster. The concept of, of technical debt is, is, is simply a consequence of, of IT working with too many projects in parallel and getting pressured by the business to deliver the projects faster. It's just, I think this is a very short way of saying it, but the, the fact is that most companies, they, they have a, a legacy system that they're working with. This legacy system has been running for 10, 15 years and it has over time simply accrued technical debt and it's become difficult to work with. This means whenever you have a project, a digital project that you need to prioritize, it takes longer than you would like to get the project delivered and your business case is, is depending on they deliver faster. IT, they, they can deliver faster because they have to do their impact analysis. They have to understand how to work with the legacy system to deliver this project that you want. Typically, your, your project sponsor, board of directors of CEO will, will ask, what's happening with this project? And you will say, we're waiting for IT. There will be a pressure on IT to deliver faster. IT, they would want to deliver faster. Of course, they want to help you run the business the best possible way. So they will say, okay, we cut some corners here and then we can deliver faster. And they will do that. They're not cutting corners because they really want to, but it's because they need to in order to deliver at the time frame requested. This corner cutting is building technical debt because next time you have a project, they have to go back and say, where did we cut those corners? And, and how do we have to, to deal with this now? And that's a vicious cycle. So it just takes longer and longer and do these programs. And, and that's, that's one of the reasons that we, we are accruing technical debt. And if you understand this, hopefully you will also um, understand how to help IT perform better in sense of, of understanding how to work with them and, and maybe not pressure them too much on time or I have a di different suggestion that, that we may uh, be able to talk about a little later, which is called uh, two-speed IT, where, where you isolate the legacy systems and, and build on top of this in a way that doesn't uh, build up technical debt. So technical debt is one of the, the, the big reasons that IT projects or, or your digital transformation projects or customer excellence projects take time. What happens as a result of this is also you will have the... The, the fighting, the internal fighting between the business units, because then IT takes long time. The business, they will maybe even blame IT for, for taking the time saying we can't deliver because IT and IT, they don't want, they don't want to take the responsibility for this. So they push back uh, a lot of uh, approvals or sign offs or specification requirements. So they don't 
have this risk of delivering what the business is not needing at the end of the day. That creates an us versus them in the company. And that means that, that the, the, the project administration time is increasing significantly. The handovers, the sign-offs, we don't have a, a clear responsible for the projects in many cases, which means that if you send an email to 50 people saying, please help, then nobody will help because it's not um, directed to one person. There's no clear uh, expected delivery or delivery time. These are, are simple project administration um, one-on-ones that, that in many cases are, are not followed in organizations today because we feel we're too busy or we feel we already know how to do it and then we forget the right way of doing it. But at the end of the day, it makes our projects take unnecessarily long. And some of these things can actually be avoided if, if you remember to, to work closely with the teams, to involve all stakeholders and make roles and responsibilities really, really clear from the very beginning. Back to, uh, back to digital or, or the IT department, because you will also have a, a, resource, a, a resource challenge most cases, your organization, because you're working with, with legacy systems that, that are highly complex, you will only have a few people that knows how to work with them. And even if, if you add more people to your projects, all projects will be depending on these key people. So they will all be waiting for these key people to tell them, how do we work with this part of the project? How do we work with this part of, of the uh, system? And this is another reason it takes time because you, you can't just add more people to the project. Um, and, and of course, when you come with a new customer excellence or customer service project, you still have to compete with, with a long list of change requests to existing systems. And many of them are business critical. So all this is, is, is simply issues that, that makes it more difficult for you to get your changes through your digital transformation or, or your digitalization of, of your customer services through. And then, of course, the, the, the organizational capabilities, um, I guess you can call them. And, and this is the, the concept of procurement. This is the time it takes to, uh, to recruit new people. For, for me, I would, I would suggest considering looking at the existing talent pool that you have, because you will find in your organization there are a lot of people who've been with you for a long time and, and who are, are, are really, really motivated and engaged with your, with your company and with a little effort actually can be reskilled or upqualified to help you do your projects. So, so and this is what I'm talking about when we're talking about FTEs or, or, or time savings. If you, if you do this right, then the, 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 the people that you free up are actually people that you can reskill to work with you on, on your digitalization of your customer services. So think about, think about this. But um, let's also talk about how, how do we actually get this up and running and getting speed back to the organization because it's, it's, not, it's not all bad. There is, of course, uh, some proven solutions that will help you get, get speed back to your organization. And I'll talk to um, three areas today. One is the environment of connectivity. It is uh, the power of one and then short-term projects. For the power of connectivity, I think the more you can enable your partners to connect seamlessly to your systems, the easier it is for you to be independent on your complex legacy systems. There is a concept called um, two-speed or multi-speed IT which is, is kind of like um, the holy grail, if you like, for, for how to work with legacy systems. It's, it's a little technical, so I won't go into details now, but I would like you to know about it. The concept here is that you take your, your core systems, your legacy systems, and isolate it as a transactional core. This is where you have your systems of record. This is where you have all your financial data, your transactional data, your reporting. Then you isolate this through a connection layer, an API layer. And on top of this, this is where you'll have your, your business process management tools, your business rules, your workflow management tools. If you do this isolation properly, you can start working with uh, low-code or no-code tools that allows the business to work almost directly with process optimizations or workflows. And the connectivity between this system is done through the API down to the transactional core now, all of a sudden, you, you take some of, of the development load away from IT because 
in the systems of differentiation, the middle layer where you're working with the business process, the, the optimization of, of what you're doing, it can be done using standard tools to a greater extent. You'll never be, be able to, to not involve IT, but the involvement will be less and the development times will be sped up significantly. And IT will be free to actually work on the change requests that are there. On top of this, you have another connectivity layer, and this is where you have your, your website services, your, your application services, your app services that is connecting with the partners and users. This is what Gartner is calling systems of engagement. Again, it is, it is disconnected from the legacy system, enabling, enabling the business or you to, to actually work with the user interfaces almost uh, independently through uh, what's called content management systems. I worked with this 12, 15 years now, and, and, it, and it is working. Of course, it is, it is very simple just to, to show you, a, to show you a, 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 a slide here, but, but take the concepts and, and maybe even spend some time researching it because it's, it's not as, as difficult as, as it sounds. It is doable and it can be done with, with limited uh, effects on, on your existing legacy system. So this is why this is so effective. For, for the next step, the, the power of one. If you want this to work, if you want your transformation effort to work, if you want your, your project changes to work, the smartest thing is to begin with one team, one unit, and one project. If you start a large trains program, a transformation program, try involving as many units as you can, you'll find that, that your teams will feel that, that you take away the carpet under their feet and they don't know how to land again. It is, it is simply becoming too complex and too many changes at, at once. So if you can start with one team, um, the teams that are the most motivated from one unit, preferably or from, uh, from a few units only, and one project, it's much easier for you to, to motivate the people. It's much easier for you to set clear targets uh, for this specific project. And it's much easier to celebrate whenever you, you finish this project. And if you do this, as short-term projects, like three months maximum, with these tangible deliverables, then you and your team would be able to show the rest of the organization, this is actually working. Look, we said we wanted to do it, we did it, and now we're starting to reap the benefits. This will motivate not only the team that you've selected, but also other people around the teams. And when you start the next change projects, more people will see, hey, when, if I'm working with these people, there's actually a good chance it's going to be a success and will be celebrated. So let me join. And this is key to get it started. Start with, with, with one team, start small and make sure that your projects are as, as short as possible. Because you will simply you'll deliver value to, to the company faster, but, but the, the investments that you will have will also be smaller. And yes, even if you have a large change project, most cases you can actually take even a big, big change project and cut down to sizable chunks that delivers value individually. Then a question would be, but doesn't that mean that it'll take longer at the end because we have to, to, to shape it up and, and demonstrate value? Yes, it will. But remember, during this time, you will actually start delivering the value instead of waiting 18 months for a project to finish and start delivering value. You will deliver, I don't know, maybe six times instead value to the company. So even though it takes some more longer end to end, it'll start delivering value to the company much, much faster, and you'll be able to celebrate your successes earlier on also. All right, uh, I have a couple of comments left. One of them is about people and culture, because so far we've been talking about business cases, return on investment, we've been talking about uh, projects and digital. Now, we are working with people. And... If you want to change people, you have to change people's habits. And we also know, I know, that changing habits is one of the most difficult things ever. So how do we start this? How do we, how do we avoid having the turf wars? How do we avoid having a resistance to change? You can avoid resistance to change altogether, but, but there are some things that you can do to, to, to reduce it at least. First, set a truthful and believable North Star for the project, but not only for the project, for for the larger transformation program or the larger customer excellence program. So whenever you do the, the smaller project, you can say, yes, we have this big North Star guiding us. And this project that is a smaller project is directly aimed towards this North Star. That is why we're doing it. It will help people focus. It will help people understand why they're doing it. 
but you will also benefit from their knowledge because they can say, okay, if we know we are, if, if we know we are going this way, then if we change the project this direction, then it will reach the targets faster. So this is very important. I already mentioned this, the perfect team. Find the people who are most motivated for working with you, who are willing to change, who are ready to change their habits. And one team only. Don't try to start too many teams at the same time. Break the projects down, as we spoke about, to smaller chunks. Celebrate the victories every time you can. Make sure that it's broadcasted into the entire organization so people are proud of working with you and your changes. I also think you should, when you're working on, on the return on investments and the business cases, you are setting clear expectations to the return of each and every project so you can get the investments approved. Use the same returns as um, performance measurements for the team saying, when we reach these returns, you will get a special bonus as part of your annual repraisal. When you link money to performance like this, your projects will also work better and smoother. I can guarantee you this. And the last thing, as I said, is enable the two-speed IC. Make sure that you isolate the legacy systems with smarter and easier to work with software tools so you can actually put a lot of the development back to the business. It is possible and it's not as complex as it, as it sounds. The last thing I would like to say is how do we how do we prioritize this? Stop the projects. Use the prioritization matrix I showed you. Make sure that you only focus on the projects that provide the more value. Rescale people. It takes too long to hire new people. Yes, sometimes you will need to hire special talent or, or simply man up because you're not enough people. But look at the talent pool that you have already and rescale them. You will find that all or most of all of your employees, they are more than willing to learn new, they're more than willing to help build a new company. If you add this to the board agenda, then you'll make sure that every time there is a board meeting, they will ask, the CEO will come and ask and focus on the projects, which will also help your projects move much faster. And as I said, celebrate the successes as much as you can. That was my words. Um, I'm open for questions or comments or whatever you want. Thank you very much.